district over here on the western slope. Today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, moisture monitoring systems and how those can potentially benefit your operation. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, just get the, the presentation rolling with uh, Mr. Miller here and we'll, we'll spend about just under an hour on this. There'll be time for questions. John likes to take his questions as he goes. So if you do have questions, you can go ahead and type them in the chat box and we'll have that up and available so that he can answer those as you go. So go ahead and type those questions in the chat box as we go. We'll go through the presentation. Uh, also keep an eye on the pointer on the screen so you can see some of the things that he might be referring to. And uh, we'll go from there. So thanks a lot, John. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, as John said, my name is John Miller. I, uh, the Irrigation Water Management Specialist for the Delta Conservation District here in Delta, Colorado. Um, and today I'm going to talk about some soil moisture monitoring techniques, uh, how people are implementing those techniques and how they're uh, helping them on their own properties. So, uh, as John said, go ahead and type your um, questions in the chat box. I can see it on the side of the screen here. So hopefully I can answer them as I go along. And let's see, how do I get to go forward? All right, so the soil moisture monitoring that I'm going to be talking about today is soil moisture monitoring for the purpose of soil-based irrigation scheduling. Um, <clears throat> so people do soil moisture monitoring for lots of different things, uh, but we're kind of ag-centered here in what we're trying to accomplish. So we're going to talk about soil moisture monitoring specifically for irrigation. Um, and so some assumptions we make here is that soil-based methods of irrigation scheduling Assume that the soil moisture content will largely determine the moisture status of the plant. Um, if there is less water in the soil and the water is held at a greater tension, it will be more difficult for the plant's roots to take up that water, which will cause plant stress. Uh, both overwatering and underwatering cause crop stress uh, and can yield, lead to yield losses. Um, and then soil moisture monitoring provides information that can be used to prevent crop stress and increase your yields. And, I'll kind of go through all this as I go along. This is just sort of an overview of, of why we're talking about this. Um, there's been a lot of changes lately in soil moisture monitoring. Um, advanced soil moisture monitoring technologies are just like other technologies and they're really coming along at a, a fast pace. Um, and they're starting to become more accessible and affordable for your average ag producer. So we're starting to see them get out onto people's properties uh, and it's starting to become more common to see these kind of systems than it was before. Um, the EQIP cost docket through NRCS EQIP uh, now includes cost share for advanced soil moisture monitoring systems. Um, and then another thing that's occurring right now is the basin wide water shortages and drought conditions are continuing. Um, here we're in the Colorado River Basin and it's going to be a very dry year. Um, and up here where I'm at, we're in the uh, the Gunnison River Basin, which is a tributary to the Colorado, and it's going to be very dry. We're, we're around 60% snowpack right now, and it's a bit alarming. A lot of our ag, uh, snow kelp sites are showing lower water, uh, lower snow amounts than we've ever seen on those sites. So uh, I, I believe, and I think it's a proven fact, slow moisture monitoring can help to address these water shortages, and I'll show you why. So the NRCS has three levels of irrigation water management. Um, they have basic, intermediate, and advanced. And so for the purpose of this talk, um, I'm just gonna uh, use those as my levels of irrigation water management and my levels of soil moisture monitoring. Uh, the basic level is your low intensity, low technology approach to soil moisture monitoring. And in this case, soil moisture monitoring is largely based on feel and appearance. Okay, so uh, so tools for basic soil moisture monitoring would be, uh, first off, the NRCS has this really great handbook, which you can see over here, pamphlet, called Estimating Soil Moisture by Feel and Appearance, and it is a must-have. Um, I believe you can get those online or from your NRCS office. Uh, it, again, it, it is a great thing. It shows you how to texture your soil and determine your soil water content um, based off of that texturing. Um, so ways to obtain soil for basic soil moisture monitoring and for that soil texturing would be a shovel. So this is how people have been doing it forever is dig a hole and see how wet the, the soil is. Um, 
other ways to get in there that are le least invasive would be like this little guy over here, which pulls its core out of the ground, and you can pull it from certain depths that you're trying to reach, so you, you can get a bit deeper without having to dig a really giant hole. Um, and then you can get a little bit of the soil out of the, the scoop there on that probe, and you can texture that, and again, use this estimating soil moisture pamphlet and help to determine what your soil moisture is. And then lastly, we have over here a soil moisture ball probe. Uh, and these things are basically a metal T, and they have um, a little uh, uh, metal ball on the base of there. And you take that T and you push that down on the ground. It will not go on the ground if the ground is um, dry. It will only go into the ground if the ground is wet. And it will go to the depth of your your um, soil moisture. So let's say you have a center pivot and you irrigate down, uh, you put down two inches of water and then you want to see how deep into the ground that two inches of water went. You can take that probe and push it down and see how, um, how, how deep that water is getting. Uh, that probe can also, some people take right down on the tip where the little um, ball bearing is and they'll attach a piece of drill stem and then you get down there low and you can just turn that and get a little piece of of soil to texture and use your, your estimating soil moisture by field and appearance pamphlet to determine what the moisture is at, the, at those depths. Um, so these are all your basic, basic ways to get your soil moisture. Um, the second level of irrigation water management that the NRCS has is your intermediate. And in this scenario, you're using field moisture sensors with manual downloads or readings that are conducted in the field. So here would be some examples of what these field soil moisture sensors would look like. Um, we've got uh, a number of different types here. This is called an XTEC uh, soil moisture sensor, and it's actually giving you percent of soil water content. And you take this thing and you push it down on the ground. It, it only goes about six, eight inches deep, so you're not getting real deep on this, but it'll give you a percent down here of the actual soil water content. So it, it's these are pretty handy. They cost about $250, $300 a piece. Um, different, there's different ones made by different companies, that, but the point is you can take that out if you're growing some kind of row crop, you know, onions or strawberries, and poke that in the ground at different areas and see, you know, what your soil water content is. Um, another very uh, common type of simple soil moisture probe is what you see up here at the top. These are aerometer tensiometers, and you fill these things with fluid, you put a vacuum on them with a vacuum pump, and then you bury them in the ground to the point that you want to monitor uh, your soil. So if you want to look at a 12 inch area, you have a crop with a 12 inch root zone that you're trying to focus on, you set those to where the probe at the end of them, at the tip of them is down at that 12 inch zone, and then um, you can it, it, as the soil dries out, it'll pull more of a vacuum on there, and then as it get wet, gets wet again, it'll relax, and that vacuum will relax. And you can read on the meter, which is right on the side. I'm trying to get my pointer to come up here. The meter's right on the side here, and it'll show you your, your tension in the soil. So these are tension-based, and I'll go over the difference between tension-based soil sensing and, um, so, and soil water content but, uh, later on. But So the, these are, uh, you see these a lot, they're kind of an older, method for doing this. Um, another thing you can do is install one of these probes. This is a watermark um, uh, probe down here and you take these and put them in the ground. Again, it's tension-based soil moisture uh, that you're getting there. You take that thing and vary it to the depth that you want to monitor. You leave it in the ground. It has two little leads coming off of it and then you're doing manual downloadings, da downloads during this intermediate um, soil moisture monitoring. So you have items like this watermark device over here which has alligator clips here and you clip those onto the leads for this thing and then it'll give you a reading of the tension of your soil. Um, you can also get soil data loggers such as the one you're seeing over here on the hops and that thing um, what it'll do is it'll automatically take the readings off here. The reason I show it on the intermediate level instead of on the advanced is that you have to manually download the data off there. It's not telemetric so it's it's keeping that data stored in that box, and then you come out with the computer and get the data off there. Um, so these watermark ones cost um, two, 300 bucks also, similar to the XTEC. 
and then you need the probes to plant out there. And once the probes are in the ground, you can leave them in the ground um, and check, check whenever you feel like checking your soil moisture. And then these boxes here, they no longer make them, unfortunately, they're, they were a really great tool. Um, they were running about five, 600 bucks for these boxes. Um, so then we'll go to the advanced irrigation uh, level of irrigation water management. And this level is the higher technology, higher intensity approach to soil moisture monitoring. And in this, at this point, we have automated stations that are equipped with telemetry. Um, and the, so, so it's similar to the intermediate with the probes, but we're going to have automated uh, boxes that are uh, picking up that data. Sorry, we're having a little, bit, oh, a little bit of technical issues, but I think we got it. Um, so here we have a, a NRCS equipped cost docket, and we're looking at a chart here. And on there, you will notice that we've got soil moisture sensors with data loggers. So for these advanced type of systems, you can get cost share. And in this case, um, it was $1,400 this year. It's, this is an older cost docket. Um, and so we're, we're actually contributing cost share to get people to um, install more of these systems with, so if they have a really high efficiency irrigation system like drip or micro spray, something that has a higher le level of intensity of management that's needed, then we would encourage them to go ahead and, and do some type of soil moisture monitoring. Um, here's the scenario and you can see that that um, cost share goes toward the purchase of soil moisture sensors installation equipment to install them, and a data logger to log continuous soil moisture data. You can also see here that this that the NRCS will cover capacitance or resistance sensors. So this goes back to, are you getting soil water um, content or um, tension um, in your reading? So there, there are two different ways you can get information on your soil moisture. Um, you can go with resistance sensors, which aren't actually telling you how much water is in the ground, they're telling you how tense the ground is. So as the ground gets, as the ground, when the ground is wet and a plant is trying to draw water out of there, the ground is sort of relaxed and the plant can easily suck that water out of there like through a straw. Um, but as the ground gets drier, the plant has to suck harder and the ground gets more tense. So the ground has, uh, the plant has to work more, work more to get the water that's in the soil. And then as the ground gets too dry, the ground gets so tense that the plant can no longer pull that water out through the roots. Um, so these resistance sensors are actually telling you that tension. So how, how much resistance is there in the soil toward drawing that water out? Um, so we can take that number, which is usually in centibars or kilopascals, and we can kind of convert or equate that to um, how wet or dry the ground is. Um, these, are, these type of sensors are used more uh, are used very often because they're typically cheaper. Um, you see them a lot. They're easy to install. They, um, if something goes wrong, you can just sort of replace them. They cost about 30 bucks a piece, so they're not, they're not super cheap, but they're, they're a lot cheaper than the capacitance ones, um, which are usually around $300 a piece. So there's a factor of 10 there. Um, they have a lower accuracy level. Um, and they can lose soil connection, which is one of the things you see with these. You, let's say we wanted to set this at a foot deep in the ground. So we went ahead and um, made our, uh, our uh, augered into the ground and made our hole and we inserted this probe and then we backfill them with um, a slurry of mud over the top of there. And then you go ahead and leave it and then um, you're taking readings off there and then uh, we get into a drought scenario and you're unable to water and the ground gets really dry. You can get sort of a void which will form around this thing in the ground and an opening and it'll lose connectivity to the ground. And then it's often hard to get it to reestablish that connectivity. So you might have to reset it or set a new one. Um, so that's kind of the biggest problem you have with them. I'd say one out of 10, you might have a problem with that connectivity and it depends on really on how dry it is. Um, you don't want them to get too dry. So when people lose that connectivity, I'll tell them to go out there and um, dump a couple five gallon buckets of water on the ground and try to reestablish that connectivity before we re, uh, reinstall new probes. Um, but then over on this side, we have the capacitance sensors. As I said, these ones are about a factor of 10 times more expensive than these others. Um, 
and they actually give you soil water content by percent. So when these are attached to a, a, a data logger and you get a number off there, it's usually like 20% or 10%. Whereas, as I said, these other resistance will be kilopascal or centibar. This is percent of actual water that's in the ground. So these are giving you, uh, uh, you don't really have to do that, um, that, you know, that equation to equate the resistance to the moisture. These are telling you the actual moisture of the soil. Um, they have a higher level of accuracy, um, which you might expect with something that costs more. Uh, they also must be calibrated to your soil type. So um, let's say, you know, a 20% soil water content in a clay soil versus 20% soil water content in a sandy soil is a big difference for a plant. Um, and, and so the plant, so you're, you're going to kind of have to know your soil type and what that um, percent, of, percent of water content means for that soil type. Now with the resistance kinds, if you're in um, clay soil versus like a loam soil and you have a, a 100 resistance, then you know your plant's still working at that 100 percent or that 100 centibar resistance level to draw the water. It doesn't really matter what type of soil it's in. I hope that makes sense. Um, so these are way more like you have to calibrate these to your soil type. These you can and should calibrate them, but if you don't have the luxury of doing that, you can get by by just really paying attention to that resistance. Um, so here's here's actually a, a graph showing the resistance versus the um, soil water content. So in a loam soil, you can see if there's 50% water content, you can come down here and come across, and you can see what that would equate, equate to on the actual centibars or kilopascals of suction that the plant has to draw. Um, so this, this graph kind of helps you to equate the tension to the soil water content. Um, here where I'm at, we're usually over here in the clay and we're usually looking at, you know, look, these numbers between 100 and, and down. Um, so as, as the ground, the wetter the ground is with this, the tension, the smaller the number, the drier the ground is, the higher the number. Um, so I hope that makes sense to everybody. Now I'm going to show a couple different types of advanced soil moisture monitoring systems that we use here. Um, there are many types of these systems, as you can see down at the bottom, it's worth noting. Um, presented here are a few of the systems that I've worked with. I am not endorsing any of these systems over other systems. Um, the gentleman in this picture here, he's installing an aerometer soil moisture monitoring system and it attaches to those resistance probes, the ones that were back a couple slides on the left there. Um, so it's going to tell us cinnabars or kilopascals and how tense the soil is. This first one I'm going to touch on is uh, TRS soil moisture loggers. Um, they're made by a company called Payne Data. These are ones I have a lot of experience with. We, uh, I have purchased some of them through the district and we own some of them. Uh, you can see they use the resistance type of soil moisture sensor. Uh, they have a lower upfront price than some of the other systems you'll see here. Um, you, can, you can also attach capacitance ones to them, capacitance sensors, so they have, they're kind of versatile that way. Uh, this works off of, the, off of Bluetooth, so you put this box out in your field, you attach whatever type of sensor you're going to attach on there, um, and then you can walk out there with your cell phone with your Bluetooth on and just instantly grab the data off there. Uh, the user interface is not the most intuitive. As I'll show you here on the next slide. You have to pay for data storage on this system, so they'll store your data, I believe, for 60 days, but if you want to keep the data long term, um, you have to pay them to store it long term. This is more of like a do-it-yourself solution, so any, anybody can buy one of these boxes, buy a handful of probes, uh, you can hook up, <clears throat> excuse me, four probes per box, so you can go out there, get your probes in, and hook them up to that box and be off and running um, without having to deal with the company really or, or a lot of, um, uh, uh, without having you know representatives coming out and things like that. So it, as I said, this is kind of a DIY kind of deal. Here's the setup screen for those boxes. And you can see there's, it's not the most intuitive thing on the, the setup. You have to do the setup on a computer. You name your, box, whatever you're going to call it, field one, or in this case, pasture plot, irrigated. Um, you choose your time zone, you set your logging interval. Here I'm going to take um, data every one hour. Um, and then you put your how deep your probes are going to be. So in this case, we have those watermark tension probes. 
and we're gonna have one at eight inches, one at 24 inches. Um, you can see over here is all the different boxes that I have on my system that I'm monitoring. Um, but in this case, we're looking at this top one, the pasture plot one irrigated. And then you, you start the box up through the screen and it'll start collecting the data like you told. This is the phone app. So I have this app on my phone and then once the box is installed and running and knows where all the probes are and knows that it should take that data every, collect that data every one hour, um, it's just out there on its own picking up that data. It runs off of a nine volt battery and that battery will last for an entire season if you put a new battery in there. Um, then you go out with your, your phone and you go to this first screen here is the first screen that'll come up and you hit get data and it'll pull up the data and show you your soil moisture trends. So in this case, you can see my graph that it generated here for me, my chart. And you can see again, the wetter is the lower number, which is up the top. The drier is the higher number, which is down at the bottom. So you can see where this ground has started to dry out and then it's got an irrigation event or a rain event and then bounce back up. So we can kind of monitor how quickly it's drying out in the, on this field. Um, you can go to the, if you don't like looking at the chart, you can go back to um, the table and you can actually see every hour and it gives you the date and the hour that the reading was taken and it gives you the number of the reading. Um, so the it, setting these up was a little bit challenging, but once you got them set up and have that app installed on your phone, um, the user interface on the app is amazing. I mean, it, it was really easy to use and, and showed the data that I wanted to see and was very intuitive. Um, we use these out at our uh, experimental pasture plot, which um, we're actually working with CSU, the Delta Conservation District is, CSU and Delta County, we're all working together. And we have an experimental um, grass pasture plot in, at Hotchkiss at the fairgrounds here in Hotchkiss, Colorado. Um, so you can install this app, the Tane app, and on your phone now, you, you don't have to own one of the boxes. And you can open that app and look at our data from that pasture plot and kind of get a feel for what the app is like. So you could go to Google Play or the iPhone app store, search for Tane data, um, Tierra, and you can see you want the one here that says Tierra, you don't want the one that says Tierra Utility. Um, and then you can log in with our, um, we have just sort of a dummy login for people to go in there and see the data. Our login email address is hotchkisspastureplot at gmail.com and our password is ABC, ABC, ABC. Um, so you can go in there and pull up and look at our stuff. You can't really damage anything. You can see what it's kind of like to run one of these apps and see the soil moisture. Or um, incidentally, you can also stop by the Hotchkiss Pasture Plot, which I would encourage to anyone that's in the Hotchkiss area. And we usually do a uh, summer field day. Uh, it's typically in the fall, and I'm sure we'll have one this year in the fall of 2018. So uh, come out there and take a look and, and see what we've got going on. There's a lot of data out there on different types of grass, grass pastures. We have a pollinator habitat. Um, so there's a lot of information there. Um, please stop by. This is a different type of system. It's um, Davis equipment. Um, a lot of people have this piece here, which is the Vantage Pro um, set up as a home weather station. So you see these a lot in orchards or people that have small uh, truck gardens. They get these little home weather stations from Davis and this is sort of the output screen. So they have this in their home and it's got the data on the screen that they're picking up from their weather station. And the cool thing about this is you can then just attach onto this a soil moisture monitoring unit, which is this piece over here on the left with the solar panel. Um, again, you can hook four of these um, probes up to it. This type, you can only use the resistance probes. So it's gonna give you that cinnabars or kilopascals it's going to give you that tension reading. It's not going to give you soil water content. Um, but it'll just sync up with your existing Davis weather station and you can be doing soil moisture monitoring on sort of a small acreage basis right off the bat. Uh, so here is some folks installing one of these. Uh, as I said, <clears throat> said, it uses resistance sensors. Uh, the user interface on these was very advanced. You have to be a pretty technical to figure out how to set this thing up. It seems to be targeting a very technical user. Um, however, this does mean there's a lot of options. So if you are a technical user, this might be the way to go for you. You can connect, as I said, you can connect this, this to your existing Davis weather station. 
this is great for people with orchards because you see a lot of these David, Davis weathered stations out there in those orchards already. These, as far as we go on advanced soil moisture monitoring systems, these are probably in the lower price range. Um, they do meet the NRCS criteria for that Equip um, cost share. So you can definitely put these in through Equip cost share and we've, we've seen it done. There's no need for a cellular modem on these um, because they're talking through a radio wave to that home weather station. Um, so there's no subscription. So there's no long-term subscription fee there. And down here, you can see one of the charts that's generated. Again, there, there's a lot of data that you can import here, which can make kind of a messy chart. Um, so you have to be really confident in that technical aspect of dialing in what you want to look at. This is a newer version of a similar type of deal from Davis Equipment, the same company. This one has a cellular modem. So again, they have the small weather station over here on the left, um, which is powered by a solar panel. Um, and inside this little white box is a cellular modem. And then out in the field, in this case in the orchard, you have the um, actual soil moisture monitoring location. So here's the box with the probes attached up to it. Um, and then it beams that data back over here to the main weather station. And the main weather station sends that back data through the cellular modem um, to the cloud, and then you're able to access that data from your cell phone or from a, um, a computer, um, but these have a monthly subscription fee. Um, they also are more of a mid-level price range, so as whereas that other one, the one that did not have the subscription fee by the same company was a bit cheaper, these are all a little bit more beefed up and more of an advanced system, and, and so they're a bit more expensive. The boxes are, have a little bit larger solar panel. You don't have to put that, um, you, you don't have to um, worry about the batteries as much. They're a, a beefier bat battery in there. Um, but you do have that monthly subscription fee for the cell, cell phone modem. And Davis also has a monthly subscription fee for their service. So you're starting to talk about some uh, adding, some subscription fees that are adding up here. <clears throat> this system here is a aerometer system. The aerometer is a big player in the soil moisture monitoring field. Um, and you can kind of see over here this little triangular shaped uh, device. You put, put these out in your field, wherever you choose to do your soil moisture monitoring. You attach your probes to there. In this case, again, it's the resistance sensor. So those cheaper ones, the $35, 30 to $35 ones that give you the cinnabars and not the soil water content. Um, you hook them up to the uh, wires coming out of this little triangle, wherever you want to do your monitoring. And then the triangle has a, a solar panel, which is over on this side over here. And it's collecting the data off those probes and then it's beaming that data wirelessly to a base station, which in this situation is over here on the left. Um, you can see the base station has a soil moisture monitoring, or a, a, excuse me, a weather station attached to it. So it's also giving this um, producer weather information. Um, and you can see right here under the weather station is the, um, the data collection point. So it's getting all the field data collected there. And then it's actually putting it into a modem, a cellular modem. And again, it's sending that data up to the cloud, actually through this little black thing up here. And you're able to access that data on your cell phone or on your computer. Um, this system is in tandem with Rinky center pivots. So, Rinky Center Pivots installed this whole irrigation system for this person, and then um, the person was inter interested in doing soil moisture monitoring, and so um, uh, Rinky and Aerometer teamed up, um, and it kind of made a hybrid system. Uh, Aerometer has just standalone systems that are that are very similar. You don't have to go through Rinky to purchase them, but in this case, the system that I'm really familiar with here is both Aerometer and Rinky. <clears throat> it's a mid-level price range, so. Again, um, we'll see some that are a bit more expensive toward the end. This, this one would qualify for an RCS equip cost share. Um, and with it, you do have a subscription fee. Uh, this is, so all this can be accessed, the weather station, soil moisture monitoring information, and the center pivot data, and this electronic valve that you see here, and there's an electronic flow meter, which you don't see in this picture. All that can be um, accessed from one location and from one app which looks like this. This is the all-in-one app for the Reiki Center Pivot and the Aerometer Soil Moisture Monitoring um, System. You can see this is the dashboard over here. You can see the different 
pivots. There's a partial pivot here, three quarter, and a um, full pivot. And the full pivot is actually running when I took this screenshot. Um, and it actually had the end gun on, which is the little yellow bump out at the end there. Um, so this guy can control these pivots from this control panel. He can start them, he can stop them. You can see if they're running wet or dry. He can uh, turn on those automated valves to turn the water on or drive the pivots with no water in there. Um, he can check the flow through the pivot. He can check his pump, um, power usage, all these things, um, all from this same app. Then he can also go over here to the control panel and pull up that weather station. He can look at rain totals, um, wind speeds, um, all the good stuff. Um, all the good stuff he can access from that weather station. And then in there you can see the soil moisture monitoring location. So <clears throat> you can see the big guns, there's a big gun soil moisture monitoring location. There's a, a soil moisture monitoring location under the three quarter center pivot. There's one under the full circle center pivot. So he can pull these up from his phone app and then look at these uh, graphs that are being generated similar to the one you can see here. And again, this is the resistance once, uh, so it's giving you tension in centibars. So as we get the, the number gets up here higher, the ground or uh, lower, sorry, at the top of the graph, then the ground is wet. And as the number gets higher toward the bottom of the graph, the ground, ground is um, drier. So you can see every time that he's irrigated with that system. So technically this guy can pull up his soil moisture monitoring um, station, take a look at it, see how wet the ground is in that location, um, then he can turn on an automated valve. He can start these pivots, um, start them wet, get the water out there through the automated valve, look at the flow out there, make sure everything's working correctly on the pivot, and he can watch the water go up um, on this uh, graph and while uh, on his soil moisture monitoring graph. And while he does all this, he doesn't even technically have to be there at the property where he's doing it. Um, so he uses, he um, on this particular system had a uh, issue with one of the pivots and he got a notice. He was in another state. He got a notice within, I believe it was two minutes and he was able to shut down that pivot and see that something had happened there and shunt the water to another location and prevent catastrophe from occurring and then call his irrigator who was taking care of the property while he was gone and let him know there was a problem out there. So this type of full, fully automated system gives this guy a lot of, of uh, flexibility on monitoring when he needs the water and turning that water on exactly when he needs it. <clears throat> Here's a system that we have in an orchard near here, uh, near our office. This is Spectrum Technology System. Uh, and Spectrum Technologies is the company and Watchdog is the name of the soil moisture monitoring system. This system uses capacitance sensors. So it's giving you soil water content by volume. Um, it's very user friendly, has a very user friendly interface has very good customer service that we enc encountered. This is my, uh, the higher level price range on this one. So if you're getting that NRCS cost share, you're, you're having more come out of pocket when you're buying a system like this. Um, but to me, the components seem to be very high quality and the user interface was um, of, of good quality as such that it, it seemed like it was worth that higher price, length, higher price level. Um, this one does have the subscription fee for the, um, for their data, access online and it also has a cellular modem fee that you have to pay on it. Um, you can see here, here's one of the boxes up at the top of the uh, hole that the guys put them on so that they are able to talk through the orchard to each other and not lose connectivity. Um, here's part of the interface here where he's picked his Gala apples and he's done his 12 inch and his 24 inch probe. And you can see down here at the bottom again, this number, um, so, on, on the tension number, the higher the tension number, the drier the ground. But on the soil water content probes, the higher the number, the wetter the ground. So there's a little bit of a trick there. Um, this one, since it is soil water content, you can see right, his number was at 40%. And then we can watch right here, he irrigated um, uh, on August 20, 21st when it was kind of late in the evening. And you can watch his water um, level spike up there to about 55 percent. Uh, and so with this type of system, you can see very accurate irrigation records. You can see almost to the hour when this guy started applying water. It takes a little bit of time for that water to get down to the probe, depending on how deep the probe is, but still it gives you a really good idea of when he applied the water. And it gives him a very good idea of when to turn the water off. So if he's looking at 
a certain level he wants there for his soil water content, he can, he can really just um, go out and get that water shut off when he needs to. Um, and if he's watching here to, at a certain level of dryness to turn it on, he can get it started right now. This is still Spectrum Technologies, um, and you can see they, they, their system is called the Watchdog, and it all has little um, dog-themed names. So the spots out in the field where he's doing the actual monitoring are called the sensor pups. Uh, the retriever is the um, repeater that's sort of grabbing the data from the sensor pups and sending it to the computer um, or to the cellular modem. So they've used some um, fun dog-themed names there. And this one comes with a map showing you the different locations where you're doing the soil moisture monitoring. Um, and then it comes with the ability to generate, generate um, reports, so like an end of season report. So he can print out a report showing every time that he irrigated and how dry the ground was when he started and how wet the ground was when he stopped. <clears throat> so those were some of the more advanced systems that I've seen go in. We have a lot more coming in this year, so there'll be sort of um, more of these to look at in the future. Um, they're coming in from different companies or from some of those same companies with different configurations. So um, stay tuned. But at this point, you might ask, why are we doing the soil moisture monitoring and, and what are we trying to accomplish here? And it's not always as clear as it, it is in these two photos where you've got a lot of water in one and not enough in the other. Um, so oftentimes people find themselves asking, how wet is the ground? And, how, and when do I need to water um, based off of that? Uh, so I have here a little diagram showing field capacity versus wilting point. So when you first water, your soil is going to be <clears throat> at this point of saturation that you see over on the left. Um, field capacity is after that soil is kind of drained out a little, and it's a really good spot for your plants to be. They're, they're in there sucking up that water and, and um, doing okay. And then you get over here to where there's the water particles are so scarce that they're really bound to the soil and the, the soil is very tense and the roots are unable to get the water out, which is the permanent wilting point. So when your ground gets that dry, you're getting a wilt on your crop that is not, the crop will not recover from um, and that will harm your yields. So even if the crop does come back from it and continue growing because you water, um, you're, you're having yield loss in there. So you're wanting to kind of stay in this sweet spot as much as you can, which is your field capacity. <clears throat> on this chart, you can see here the different types of soil at the bottom. Um, and you can see your wilting point and your field capacity here. And of course, it changes depending on whether you're in sandy soil or clay soil. Um, here where we are at, we have kind of a clay loam. It's probably the best way to describe our soils. So you can see here, <clears throat> we don't want to get below the wilting point, and you do get above field capacity when you're irrigating usually, so we're kind of trying to just bounce in this location and stay in this sweet spot. So um, we're going to water, we're going to get up out here to saturation, the water, the soil is going to drain a little, we're going to get to field capacity, our plants are going to be evapotranspirating, um, the ground, the sun's going to be evaporating some of that water out of the soil, and the plants are going to be transpiring it out. And it's slowly going to be decreasing your water content, decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. And you're going to be monitoring all this with your um, soil monitoring system and your soil water monitoring system. And you're going to get down here near the bottom and you're going to go, oh no, we don't want to get to that wilting point and you're going to irrigate and that number is going to bounce back up again. So that's what we're trying to accomplish here with the soil moisture monitoring. <clears throat> so I'm getting near to the end here. Um, I haven't seen a whole lot of questions, but I guess oftentimes when people install these systems, the number one thing they ask me is, so what's the magic number when I need the water? Um, so that number is gonna vary depending on your soil type, crop type, um, but really I tell people that those, the numbers on their soil moisture monitoring data are not as important as the drying trends. So the first thing that I encourage people to do is to continue to water the same way they have been. So if they're watering on a schedule, like every other week or every other day, depending on the type of irrigation system and their crop, um, continue to water on that schedule. Now you just have the soil moisture probes out there or you're doing the soil moisture monitoring through your ball probe or your, um, <clears throat> your, your hand readings from your X-Tech 
probe. Um, so you're getting that information and it's helping you to, ooh, I got a, a real big question here. Um, it's helping you to, to look at your regular irrigating schedule and see how dry is the soil getting in between irrigations and how quickly is the soil drying out. That's that drying trends that I'm, I'm encouraging people to look at. So <clears throat> um, as the early in the season when the ground or when the weather is cooler and you might be getting a little rain because it's springtime, uh, your drying trend is not going to be as quick as it's going to be when you hit June, July, and the wind starts to blow and it's very hot out. And then you're going to see a pickup in that drying trend. So um, if you're monitoring those soil moisture numbers and you're monitoring those trends and you're seeing those trends change throughout the season, then you can begin to use your soil moisture monitoring information to, um, to determine, hey, this, this week the soil dried out a lot faster and we reached sort of critical levels on these numbers um, way quicker than we did the week before. And so now you're able to start to implement soil moisture monitoring to actual, actually make irrigating, irrigation decisions. But initially, early on, I tell people do not make irrigation decisions right off of your soil moisture monitoring data. Um, <clears throat> you also, uh, another thing we're seeing from producers is the differences in their soils and limiting layers means a lot of, that they have different drying times for different areas of their field or property. Um, so, um, and like, I'll just use a, for instance here, I had a, a person with a orchard and they had a lot of yellowing in one block of their trees and it was like one particular piece of that block even. And they were kind of looking at that going, well, we have some micronutrient problems there um, and we've tried different things to try to um, correct for those micronutrient problems. Um, but the, the trees are still yellowing and we're just not sure why. Um, we set some soil moisture monitors in that location as well as in other locations and um, all of a sudden the guy had an aha moment and said that location doesn't dry out as quickly as the other location. So, you know, 12 to 24 inches below the ground where he couldn't see, the ground was staying wet there because of a limiting layer that was down underneath that block. Um, so he had like, you know, some type of a bedrock layer or a clay layer um, that he didn't even know was there. Um, and he definitely didn't know it was affecting the drying times on that ground. Um, and <clears throat> it was keeping those, the, the feet wet on those trees and they were, um, <clears throat> excuse me, having issues based off of that water staying in the soil there longer. So now he's able to kind of um, match the drying trend in that location to other locations and not apply water there until he needs to. Um, and he's already seen a difference in those trees. So um, and that leads me to the next point there, over or under watering impacts those crops more than the producer had anticipated. And <clears throat> I hear this um, fairly often with people that put in soil moisture monitoring systems or start to implement soil moisture monitoring practices. Um, they'll go, oh, you know, my, my ground here, this field um, was always kind of an under producer compared to the neighboring field. Uh, but once I started to monitor my soil moisture, I discovered that that area was drying out a lot faster based on whatever factor. Um, and then they're like, I, and suddenly I'm able to equate that that um, yield impact was directly related to the soil moisture there. Um, and they just, it just hadn't been that intuitive to them before. So those are things that people are picking up directly from the, the soil moisture monitoring that I'm seeing as we're starting to implement a lot more of that in our area. What have I learned from this, um, being an irrigation water management specialist and helping a lot of people install these and maintain them and uh, interpret the data from them. And so what I've learned is that some pr producers need a lot more help than others. So you have people with a broad spectrum of um, knowledge and a broad spectrum of capability so either they're installing the systems on their own and I come out there and suddenly they're installed or they're calling me or they're calling the tech support for the systems they're installing um, and they're saying, hey, I'm, I'm having issues here. Um, also, there's just that broad spectrum of people interpreting the data. Some people are getting that data and they're, they're doing some um, Google searches on the crop they're trying to raise and they're going, oh, this is what I should be doing and they're making adjustments um, or they're calling me you know, every couple of days and saying, here's what the number is, what do you think? Um, another thing I'm seeing is some people love to check their phone. 
and by extension their soil moisture uh, and some people do not even have a phone so there's again that broad spectrum of ag producers so when we're out there um, looking at people's properties and trying to help them with conservation practices we have to really try to discover what level these people are at on that spectrum and then we can um, help them hey maybe you're a better fit for basic soil moisture monitoring with one of these ball probes um, or maybe you're a better fit with advanced soil moisture monitoring and you want the bells and whistles and can run your entire system from your phone um, so we for me it's just kind of trying to learn what type of person I'm dealing with and then to deal with them accordingly. Uh, advanced soil moisture monitoring systems also help people to automatically keep their records. So if people are having to keep irrigation water management records, um, some people need to do that for NRCS equip contracts. Some people also um, just keep uh, records just because, which is a great practice. Um, it can always, you know, people, I always encourage people to keep records of their yields and of their irrigation and of their weather circumstances. And you can always use that data in a dry year to help you make decisions um, about what your best course of action is to deal with drought. Um, so this just advanced, this advanced soil moisture monitoring systems are helping these people to do that automatically without them having to go through and, uh, you know, keep it on in a notebook somewhere. So if people have those fancier systems, it really helps them, encourages them to keep those records. And so we're to the questions point, and I see one over here on the side that says, can you explain how a vegetable farmer might utilize the sensors when each row might have a different crop? Would you want a sensor in each type of crop with different water needs? Also, you talked about above ground irrigation, but would subsurface drip impact anything? Okay, so first off, um, how a vegetable farmer could utilize the sensors with each, when each row might have a different crop. So in that situation, they might want, um, either they would want to buy a lot of soil moisture probes and, and, and install those in at different depths, depending on the rooting of the crop they're dealing with in those different rows. So let's see if I can go back here. Um, so I'll go back to my, oh, here we go. Okay, so I had that basic soil moisture monitoring slide back here, and I'm gonna go back to it. And on there, it shows some things that might help for the scenario you're talking about. Um, so we have, Actually, it's going to be in the intermediate where it's going to be at. Am I doing a terrible job here, John? It's going, right. it's going backwards. It's just taking some time. Okay. So in there, I have that X-Tech, and there are different probes like that where you can just – right there. There we go. That was the one. So you can see over on that left-hand side that X-Tech soil moisture probes. There's different companies that make these. Um, and you could just, with something like that, a, mo a mobile one, if, if you will, you can walk along and just poke that in the ground right where you need it. So you can take it to different depths. You could do a shallow one and then push it down to as far as it'll go, which is about six, eight inches, and get a deeper one. And you could do that in every row and for every crop. So this is kind of like a, a mobile option for soil moisture monitoring. <clears throat> if the people want to get intense and install probes, they could install some of, the, some of these probes in each each type of crop and then use this watermark. Again, it, it's the cheaper option. You don't have to have it hooked up to um, a data logger and get a reading off of there. Um, or they could use these aerometer um, tensiometers and put, put a couple of these in each row. Um, so these are more probably, um, if you have really a dynamic changing type of situation where you have a lot of crops or a lot of soil types or something like that, you might be looking at something like this. These, the X-Tech, I don't, by any means want to just encourage that one company but that's the one probe that i use a lot um there's different companies doing that and those ones are they i wish they made a longer probe they don't um so you could poke that down like 12 to 24 inches but they don't make them that long uh, but this is a really handy thing for people especially if they have like a truck garden or a, a market garden or something that has a lot of different options uh, of crops with a lot of different rooting depths um, <clears throat> your other question about the subsurface drip. So this same slide right here has 
some, this drip here is on subsurface um, in the one with the little soil moisture monitoring box. Drip in general is very difficult to tell. It can, it can be very difficult, especially when people first install drip. It's, it can be hard for them to tell how much water they're getting into the ground and how deep that water's going. Um, so I encourage people when they're putting in a high intensity system that takes a lot of management like drip or microspray, they definitely should be doing some kind of monitoring because um, you know you put in a drip system and the first thing that happens is the people call me and they say, hey, I don't know what's happening here. The ground looks dry, the drip system is running, I don't know whether the crops are wet or dry or what the, what the circumstance is. So um, I would just encourage those people to, to do that monitoring and whether it's above ground drip or below ground drip, get, get some kind of monitoring going there so you can tell what's happening below the surface because it's not always intuitive with the drip system. Um, and then any ideas on how to keep the center safe in a youth pick field with the public walking through there regularly? <clears throat> That's a great, a great um, question also. Um, and I, I would say it would be very similar to, and I unfortunately don't have a very good picture of this, but this guy that's installing this um, thing in the field here, uh, he's, this is a hay field and it has um, horses, cattle, and occasionally hay, hay equipment. So swathers and balers come through there. And so he has this thing sticking up in the middle of his field wherever he does the soil moisture monitoring. And so he's went ahead and he actually put some hog panels and he made a little cage around this. And then he tied some bright ribbon on the top of there so he can see it when he's driving along with his swather and doesn't run over all of it. Um, but he's put those hog panels around there to keep the, um, the, the uh, draft horses that he has from rubbing up against that thing and breaking it and to keep the cattle from rubbing against there. So um, people get creative different ways to make kind of a little cage around there to, to protect it. One thing I often do when I'm setting probes for people is I'll take a ripper or have them take a ripper and rip a little trench and then we can put <clears throat> um, a lot of these cables you can use cat5 cable a lot of the probes you can use cat5 cable which is like ethernet cable for a computer um, you can buy that cable in a bundle and you can attach the probes to the cable and then bury everything under the ground including the cable and then you can actually get these the the part that sticks up out of the field by running it out under the ground with the cable. Um, so you could potentially put your, your part that could be impacted by people or animals out of the field over to the side and get all that wiring underground. And then people wouldn't even know that it was there. They'd be walking right over it and couldn't tell. So <clears throat> that would be my, um, my suggestion for uh, people in the UPIC field and trying to deal with that. John, why don't you go to the field that we have, our AIM data you stuff. Bet. We also put, uh, built a custom box. So you see right. that post right there? There's a hollow post. So our, our wire runs down through the middle of this post um, and out the bottom of the post. And there's a flat base here with an anchor point where we're pounding this into the ground. And then <clears throat> underneath that flat base is where we're doing all the wiring connections excuse me, and we're hooking up the probes to the box. And then this box actually has a lock on there. So you can lock this box up. We have these custom made. Um, they cost about 160 bucks probably per box. But if a person was so inclined, they could make them themselves. Um, on something like this one, where you're just, just grabbing that data with Bluetooth and you're not looking at like some kind of um, radio relay between these boxes, you could build the box down into the ground like even one of those irrigation boxes that have the valves in there you know that you see in like a park that you have the, the top you can take off and it's down in the ground you can put these tiara boxes down in the ground and have them connected up to the probes now with one of the ones that has to have the radio connection you couldn't do that because that information is wirelessly having to relay back and forth and <clears throat> it has to be like a sight distance type thing so you couldn't put that in the ground but but this type you totally could um, and people could walk right over that box. So yeah, that's a great point from John here. We we made these boxes specifically because this is our experimental pasture plot and we're trying to keep people from, you know, damaging the boxes or, or walking off of them. Yeah, we also, like you were saying, we just built a trench for all the wires and all the way to the probe. 
and then we covered them all over with the grass and soil and so <laughs> Everything's underneath the ground. They're, they're, we don't have to do anything when we come in and do work on this plot, whether it's using a mower or hay or anything. So these are good options, and I think you can hide all these things. So That's a good point. So out, out here, actually, where my cursor is right now is where the actual probes are. They're out in that field, and they're under the ground, and then we ran that wiring for them under the ground all the way back up here to the pipe, and then even under the ground along the pipe, and then into our box, and that way, we can hay over the top of our sensors, our soil moisture sensors, our probes, and not have to worry about any of that being damaged. And this this box is all the good stuff just outside the field where, where we don't have to worry about the swaths are getting it. All right, well, we got another minute or two. If anybody has any other questions, we could entertain some of those right now. Um, thanks, John, really appreciate that. That was an awesome presentation. Like John was saying, we're gonna have a lot of updates to this as we go. And so we'll probably try to continue to, you know, see what we can do to update this and maybe put some newsletter articles and things together. You bet. And here we've got um, my, my phone number. If you have any more, I, I know I, this is kind of a shock and approach to all this. There's a lot here. And so if you have any questions about any specific part of this, you can give me a call and I'd be glad to talk about it. Um, I'd just like to make a special thanks to CSU for helping me get this information out there and to the Delta Conservation District who um, is my employer. And so it's always nice to have an employer and I really appreciate them. They're a great uh, group of people and they also are helping to fund part of this. So um, much thanks to them for all they've done for both of these entities, CSU and the DCD. So yeah, definitely thanking the Delta Conservation District for sponsoring the uh, webinar here today. So uh, looks like we're all set on questions and we're about out of time. So. We'll have this stuff up and recording and it'll be online here before you know it. So if there's any other uh, folks you want to share this with or other people uh, you want to look forward to sending this to, we'll have it up on our website here in the next week or two. And we'll be uh, writing a follow-up newsletter and all that to make sure we get the word out on this. So uh, in the meantime, thanks very much for, for joining us today. And we'll look forward to hearing about future things on this.